Well, go ahead and open your Bibles to Titus. Titus chapter 3 is where we are this morning. Titus chapter 3. If you need a Bible, there's a Bible in the seat in front of you. Titus chapter 3. We have been working our way through the book of Titus, and we are down to just the last uh, three, three weeks, uh, three, three messages, uh, including today. Uh, and what I want to start with is chapter 3, verse 8, is where I want to begin. And so Titus chapter 3, verse 8, and here's what it says. This saying is trustworthy. I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed God might be careful to devote themselves to good works. These are good and profitable for everyone. So notice that line, so that those who have believed God might be careful to devote themselves to good works. Those of you who are in Christ, God's word is saying that he wants you to be careful to devote yourself to good works. In case you missed it in Titus, this idea is is smattered all throughout the book. Look at chapter 2, verse 6, 6 and 7. So chapter 2, verse 6 of Titus still. In the same way, encourage young men to be self-controlled in everything. Make yourself an example of good works with integrity and dignity in your teaching. So example of good works. Jump down to verse 14. He gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to cleanse for himself a people for his own possession. And note, eager to do good works. In case you're still missing it, jump down to chapter 3, verse 1. Remind them to submit to rulers and authorities to obey, to be ready for, wait for it, every good work. Let's do one more. Uh, Chapter 3, verse 14. Let our people learn to devote themselves to good works for pressing needs so that they will not be unfruitful. Picking up a theme and all that's going on here, uh, this is a, something that's been repeated throughout here in this uh, short book of Titus for God's people in, in living in a culture that is virtually godless living under their own authority, and so as believers are to live, they live under the authority of God, and in that, they are to be eager to do good works. Now that you are saved, now that you know Christ, go and do this. Go and live it out. How you live matters. As believers, we live for Him. And so if we're to live for him, my question would be, how? But how? You, you, you want to walk with the Lord, but, but with all that's going on in your world, what does that look like? What does it look like to be eager for good works, to, uh, to devote yourselves to good works? What does that What does that even look like? How do we do that? Well, here's what I thought I would do this morning is I would try to to help by maybe creating uh, creating a little case study. Uh, I've called him Barry, uh, and uh, let me explain Barry's life for you. Barry, he he lives, his life is, uh, if you were to explain it to you, it's nonstop. Uh, Zero downtime. It's crazy busy for him. Uh, Stress in his world is significant right now. Uh, There's stress at uh, at work 
that is significant, and there is stress in the home that is, uh, is just very much there. He's often just stressed. You get to know Barry a little bit, and you would find out as well. Uh, he's, he's bothered with uh, the fact that he's, he's gained some weight. Yeah, he tries to eat well. Uh, he has a plan, tries to set to throughout the day. In fact, often he starts off doing well, and because he's done so well, he finds himself with little cheats uh, in the afternoon. Um, this, this has been hard for him. Um, uh, this week he had to say no to a friend of his uh, about something they wanted to do. Uh, and quite frankly, if you were to dig a little bit more, he, he just hates disappointing people. And he's had to disappoint his friend. This, is, this has been on his mind. On his mind, just running in the ram of his mind. Uh, just, it's always just kind of running there. It always runs underneath the surface is uh, w- with all of the increase of prices and uh, of goods today, there's just financial stress and, and pressures that are regularly just running in his mind. One more thing about him is that he, uh, Barry keeps what I would call secret gardens, uh, secret gardens, um, it, it, these would be his guilty pleasures. Uh, secret gardens would be his escapes. Uh, a, a secret garden would be an escape apart from God. Doing things and engaging in things that would be apart from God, I just need a relief, and so these are the little secret gardens that he keeps. He, he, he doesn't like it, but what are you going to do? Uh, if you were to follow his life at all, I mean, he's fairly consistent at church. He, he tries to keep up with a reading plan in the Bible. He, he dabbles in reading uh, the Bible. He dabbles in prayer. He's fairly consistent in his small group. But if you were to maybe dig down just a little bit more, uh, and he were to be really honest with us, uh, he would tell you and be able to confess to you that, for the most part, really, uh, the fact that, yes, he's involved in church, and yes, he's involved in a little bit of Bible reading here and there, and tries to add in prayer and his small group, uh, quite frankly, there's just a lot of lackluster to those things. It just doesn't have a. It just doesn't do a whole lot for him. He, he he's he's committed to Jesus. the The idea of being close to Jesus that that is something that he wants. But when we start bringing up verses like this, and good works and living, and he doesn't know how to live out these very things that we've just been reading. Can you, can you relate to Barry at all? Um, here's what I would say. God speaks to these very things. There is a point where life and, and Scripture, they meet. And God's word speaks to these very things if we will slow down and consider them. What I want to do this morning is is back up uh, just a couple of verses and start in verse 4 of Titus chapter 3. And and I'll read through through verse 8 again. But in here is a foundation that we want to build on. It's going to be very similar to what we read in chapter 2 in verses 11 following this profound passage on salvation. But here it is again. It's, it's so significant. Uh, it's repeated again. Here is chapter 3, verses 4 through 8. Follow along with me in your Bibles. But when the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us not by works of righteousness that we had done, but according to his mercy, 
through the washing of regeneration and renewal by the Holy Spirit. He poured out his Spirit on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs with the hope of eternal life. This saying is trustworthy. I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed God might be careful to devote themselves to good works. These are good and profitable for everyone. So here in verses 4, 5, 6, 7 is uh, this one massive thought, this one massive idea, and it is God's kindness and his love that appeared. Salvation. So if you are a Christian, you're here this morning if you're a Christian, meaning you've trusted in Christ, you are his, this, uh, that you would, you would become heirs with the hope of eternal life. If this is you, you're a Christian. My question would start off was, do you know why you're a Christian? Why are you a Christian? And the answer to that is simply because of his mercy. It's just simply because he chose you. It's his mercy poured out on you. Verse 5, he saved us, not by works of righteousness that we had done, but according to his mercy. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, if you're a Christian, it's because he saved you, not because of your works. It wasn't because... Uh, maybe this will help dispel some idea. Uh, it wasn't because there's nothing here of, or anywhere in Scripture for that matter, of, well, he, what he did was he looked down the corridor of the future and saw that you were going to choose him. And therefore, he's like, oh, I know you're going to choose me, so I'll choose you too. And then he, there's nothing about that. It wasn't because of your your works of righteousness, but because, oh, he saw something in you, like, oh, I see, there's, there's this, you're going to do some really great things for me, and so I better choose you on my team. He saved us, not by works of righteousness that we had done, but according to his mercy. Why are you a believer if you're a believer? Simply because of his mercy. Just because of his mercy. His mercy that was poured out on you. It's because of his work. That's it. His salvation comes not because of works, but because of his mercy. And now works that happen... As we saw throughout here, there's little verses that we looked at earlier. Our works are a result of salvation, not to get salvation. Huge difference in the direction they go. The reason why we do good works as believers is because it's a result of his mercy in our lives, him saving us. Because he saved us, now I go and do good works. I don't do good works so that I can get recognized by him and get chosen by him on his team. It's because of his work. So just trying to wrap our minds around this, this idea is God intervened for the sake of the helpless and hopeless. The theme throughout, this is the gospel. The gospel is that God intervened he intervened for the sake of the helpless and the hopeless. That was a work of God. He intervened to those of us who have been helpless and hopeless. It's the gospel. You even see the work of the Trinity here. The, the, 
all the, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, all involved in the work of salvation. Verse 4, when the kindness of God our Savior. There's God the Father. Later on in verse 5, through the washing and regeneration and renewal by the Holy Spirit, he poured out his Spirit on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. You see, the whole Trinity takes part in our salvation. And now because we're saved and now we're His, our lives are changed. Our lives are set in a different direction because of His work. Our lives are changed. Now, maybe you would be responding like I think Barry would. But I don't feel any different. I don't feel anything. Or, or, or maybe the response would be, okay, but he just feels so far away. He just feels so distant. Or, yeah, okay, but, but I'm still struggling. I'm still struggling with my walk, and I keep falling. I keep failing. So, how do these verses fit into Barry's world? Where does life and scripture meet when it comes to this? I believe what I, what I want to do is I want to focus in on verse 6. I think verse 6 is going to be a significant verse for those of us that are in Christ and we think we slow down and think on this. Look at what verse 6 says. He poured out his spirit on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our savior. He poured out his spirit on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our savior. Uh, up on the screen there that verse 6 I uh, italicized that word abundantly. I, I encourage you to circle that in your bibles. Abundantly, he poured out his spirit on us abundantly. This, uh, this, this word abundantly is the, the, the word meaning a richly, graciously, generously. He, he poured out his spirit on you abundantly, richly, just generously. Uh, maybe it'd be helpful to think of the opposite. Uh, he, he wasn't stingy with the Holy Spirit being poured out on you. He wasn't stingy. He was like, eh, uh, you, I'll give you a little bit. He wasn't stingy. It means that he didn't, it didn't, the Holy Spirit didn't come in just drips and dribbles. It's, it, it's a rich, it's a full stream Ongoing, just poured out. Listen to Galatians chapter 4, verse 6. And because you are sons, God sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Because you are sons of God, God sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts. The Spirit of Jesus into our hearts. This, this verse 6 in Titus, it, uh, you'll see a real a parallel here. Uh, I love Scripture interpreting Scripture. It's how we always want to interpret Scripture. Scripture interprets Scripture. Uh, up on the screen here, Romans chapter 5, verse 5. Look what it says. This hope will not disappoint us because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. This hope will not disappoint because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. This, 
Sounds very similar, doesn't it? He poured out his spirit on us abundantly. In other words, Christian, you have the Holy Spirit in you. You have present, ongoing, you have the Holy Spirit in you if you're a believer in Christ. If you've trusted in Christ, you're a Christian, you have the Holy Spirit in you. Evidence of that is, is, is it's why he matters to you. It's, it's, why it, it, it's why God even matters to you. It, it, it's, it's why you even desire to do good works. There's a desire in you to do what God says and to do good works. It's because the Spirit of God is in you. It, it, it's why you desire to know him and to walk in him. You, you, you want to please him. It's a desire that he put there. It, it's why you are unsettled with indwelling sin in your life. Um, which, by the way, regarding sin and dwelling sin in our lives, the Spirit will not settle with sin in your life. In other words, He, he is not going to ignore it. It is impossible for the Spirit of God to ignore sin in your world. He, he, he is never going to be like, yeah, you know, everybody's got their issues. This is just yours. He can't ignore it. It's impossible for the Holy Spirit to ignore sin in your world, in your life. Uh, the other day, uh, we went to... Uh, Gilcrease Farms, just, uh, just up the road. And uh, we, we went there for the apple cider donuts that they have. So you got to go early. Uh, and uh, that's really why we went. But while we were there, we also got some apple cider. And so we got this little jug of apple cider. It was still a little bit frozen. Uh, and so at some point over the long five minutes from our how, from Gilcrease Farms to our house, uh, we forgot about the apple cider that we had put in the on the back uh, in, in our uh, back floor there. But a few days later, um, we we got into the car and um, and there was it was just it was definitely off. Uh, some there was. There was, it was, it was, it was rotten in the car. I was like, what is that? It smells like something died. Uh, and I thought, well, maybe, maybe it's something in the garage. And so, because I looked in the back and there was nothing in the back and I couldn't see anything. I don't know why our, I think it was a trap. Uh, the, our car maker underneath the driver's seat has this little pocket area underneath the seat where it steals cell phones, it steals like all kinds of stuff, and it gets lost in there. But somewhere in that five-minute drive from Gilcrease to our house uh, at a stop light or stop sign, our, the, the apple cider slipped into that, that hole and disappeared until about a, a, a you know, quarter of it uh, leaked out. Uh, into, into that, uh, that little secret compartment. And, um, and, and so I thought, well, let's just roll the windows down and hopefully it will, you know, air out. I also was thinking like, uh, do we have to pick anybody up soon? Uh, I, I, like, I'm so embarrassed. Um, and I hope this doesn't, this smell doesn't get off on me. Um, or, or my wife, Angela. Uh, and... <laughs> Um, and so it just stunk. Here's the deal. We couldn't ignore it. I really want, I don't have time to clean that. And like we pulled it out, got the jar, the big jug out, threw it away. And, and hopefully 
we couldn't just ignore it. So I had to like take the extra time and, and work through it and put all kinds of baking soda on it and a couple of times and clean and wash and vacuum. And it was, it was just a pain. We couldn't ignore it. In the same way, the Spirit of God will not ignore the sin in our lives. It's one of the markers of believers is, is repentance in their lives. Sin is pointed out in their lives and they don't ignore it. It's one of the markers of those who have the Holy Spirit in them. What this is saying, he poured out his spirit on us abundantly, is remarkable. It's, it's so amazing and, and such a gift to you who are in Christ. It is such a gift that Jesus left to give us the spirit of God. Listen to John chapter 16, verse 7. Jesus said this, I'm telling you the truth. It is for your benefit that I go away. Because if I don't go away, the counselor, who's the counselor? The Holy Spirit. Will not come to you. If I go, I will send him to you. It is to your benefit that you have the counselor, the Holy Spirit, the one who comes alongside. He's with you. To have the Spirit of God in you, it really does change everything. He's in you. The Spirit of God is in you, and if, if He is in you, it means He is with you. Now, For the most part, I think if you've been around some at all, you, you hear, we hear this, we hear this gospel regularly ongoing. And we know, yes, I got saved not because of my works, but because of his mercy. I know that. And then what happens functionally, functionally what happens is that we go, yes, I got saved by him, and now functionally, I'm required now, I now go and live in my own power, in my own management. I got saved by him, nothing I can do, but now I go and live by my own management, and I go and do and make it happen. Um. I become less dependent on him and more dependent on myself, functionally. Here, here's what that would look like. Uh, if, if you leave, when you leave, if you go get in your car, you start your car, and then you get out, and you start to push your car back home. Now, here's... What I know, because you're so, the church is just so kind and loving. You're going to, if you do that right away, you're going to see, there's going to be a whole bunch of people that will come and say, hey, let me help you. And they're going to get in and we're going to start pushing. And we're going to start pushing you. And then somewhere along the way, somebody's going to hear, is that, the, is that the engine running? Well, yeah. Is, is something wrong with it? No, works fine. <laughs> Can you imagine the scene? <laughs> well, why don't you get in and like drive it? Because how else am I going to do this? You know, push a lot of my effort, a lot of my energy, self-management. Because a lot of self-reliance. But is that not functionally how we often live 
in our world. <laughs> the Spirit of God is in you, but yet we get out and we just try to push. We become self-dependent. Self-management becomes the order of the day. Let's, let's, go, let's go back to Barry. Let, let's use Barry as our example. Remember, non-stop, zero downtime, crazy busy Barry. He's got a lot of things going on, a lot of stress in his world. A lot of stress at work, a lot of stress at home. His health matters to him. He's, his body image matters. He's concerned about what others think of him. He has financial stresses in his world. He's been trying to manage his secret gardens, those guilty pleasures of his, his escapes. He tries to keep reading the Bible. He tries prayer. He, he tries to get to a small group. Knowing him, what is Barry dependent on to get through his days? What is Barry dependent on to get through his days? Barry. What's missing in his life? The Spirit of God. Dependence on the Spirit of God. So what would that look like if he became more and more dependent on the Spirit of God who is with him? The engine's running. I know from verse 6, he poured out his Spirit on us abundantly. He's given us the Spirit. In other words, he's not stingy. Just, just listen, listen again to what Jesus says in Luke eleven thirteen. If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more? Will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? He's not stingy. How much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? So, so what does, how, how does He become more Spirit-dependent and less self-reliant? Knowing that the Spirit of God is in him, things will change in his life. For, for one, he begins to invite the Lord into these very areas of his life. He, 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 he's, he's, he begins to ask God to help. He invites the Lord in. He's, he's talking to the Lord as things pop up in his life. Uh, areas of his schedule where he just feels so stretched. Areas of his finances where it just is, is constantly running there. Areas of stresses that he feels at work and at home. Places of his relationships that, that are struggling places where he feels like a failure. He, he's inviting the Lord into areas where he knows he's not meeting expectations of others, let alone even himself. He's inviting the Lord in. God, God I need help. <laughs> Lord, would you speak to this? It's, it's in the little moments inviting the Lord in. It's, it's, this becomes really personal. There, there, there will be little shifts that go on in his world where he, he, he is, his prayers are changing for, from, 
Lord, just fix this, whatever this is, so that I can get back to normal. Again, we, we probably don't pray that. I want to get back to normal. But underneath the surface, oftentimes, if we just take a look at underneath the surface of our heart, a lot of times our prayers are, Lord, I'm in such a pickle right now, just fix it because I want to get back to normal. This is a freebie. God isn't interested in just your normal. He's interested in in your holiness. He wants you to grow in him. He wants you to know him. And, and so your, your prayers, as you become more and more dependent on the Spirit of God who is in you, you, your prayers will begin to change. Lord, have your way. Lord, what do you say? Well, one of the indicators of dependence is, is, what do you say about these areas of my life, about these, these pressures and these struggles? One of the indicators of dependence on the Spirit of God versus dependence upon yourself. You, you'll, you'll grow in, in, in addressing areas of your life where you, will, you, you want to know what God says and you will get godly input, godly counsel. Uh, you, you'll become less of a, a pro at research and what does, uh, you, you'll, 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 you'll become less of just like going after all of the, uh, what does Google have to say about all of these different things, and you'll turn more and more to the Lord. Worldly solutions th- for things won't satisfy. You want to know what God says. And so you'll seek godly counsel. Instead of just turning to yourself, into your own research, you will turn to the Lord and you'll want to know what godly people have to say about these areas of your life. Um, As as Barry becomes more dependent on the Spirit of God, he's going to find that he talks to the Lord about these very areas. He's going to grow one of the areas he's going to grow in is in waiting and reliance upon the Spirit of God. Um, my guess is those are not the things that we really like. <laughs> I, I want quick answers. I, I want to... Uh, I, 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 can, you, can you move a little faster? But as we grow in the Lord, you, you slow down and you wait on the Lord and you become more reliant on him. Remember I mentioned that Barry has secret gardens? Remember secret gardens, the things that I call, these are, these are escapes for him. He, he wants to skip any suffering and difficulties and he just wants the escape. Things are hard, so what's a quick answer to that? And it's, it's the secret gardens is, is going in and going after those escapes apart from God. I'm going to go and do them myself. They can be subtle things, things that you just are used to. You, you're, you're used to uh, just going and trying to find the answer yourself. You're used to uh, just... Uh, a quick escape. You're tired, worn out, crazy busy. And so you look for quick escapes. It, it often it will fall under an umbrella called laziness. A constant thumbing through social media without any end in sight. Mindless movies. Just... It's really the easiest way, and it's just a quick escape for you. Subtle things, and sometimes not so subtle things. A pursuit after maybe maybe drinking, going after alcohol as your escape, or after pornography as your escape. 
to all the, the, the difficulties that you're facing. Not so subtle. Whatever your thing is that you turn to in order to find relief apart from God. One of the markers, as I mentioned before, of one who is growing in dependence on the Lord is ongoing repentance. You you hear the Spirit of God, you hear God speak, and if you are a believer, you do hear God speak in certain areas of your life. He goes, this is an area, and... When you are reliant on him, you act on that as opposed to ignoring or even just pushing off. It's not giving lip service to repentance and confession, but doing and acting on what he says. That's a dependence on the Lord. Because he is with you. If he is in you, he is with you. You don't ignore him. You, uh, he, he's not just a part of your life. You can partition God. Here's my God part of my life, and here's the rest of it. He has all of your life. It's all his. I really appreciated what Ed Welch said in the book Side by Side. Anything that reminds us that we are dependent on God and other people is a good thing. Otherwise, we trick ourselves into thinking that we are self-sufficient and arrogance is sure to follow. We need help, and God has given us his spirit and each other to provide it. It's a good word. And herein lies where life and scripture meet. It's, it's taking steps to be in step with the Spirit. He poured out His Spirit on us abundantly. I, I want to be closer to you. I, I, I want to experience what you have. I, I want to, to know you and follow you. And so the question, will you invite Him into these areas of your world, of your life, Or will you push him away? Asking him to help you. God, help. God, these very areas where there is strains and pressures and difficulties and areas where I have been self-reliant. Oh, help. Forgive me. I need you. I need to to grow in dependence upon you. As we know, God, I I have been so dependent on myself. So, So help. Forgive me. I want us to take a few minutes and spend some time in prayer. I find it fascinating uh, after first service uh, just how, how difficult sometimes times of prayer are in church. Shouldn't it be in church that we've become all the more comfortable in prayer. Um, God's people praying. 
uh, one, of the, one of the values that we have here is that we, we value embracing awkward. Uh, embrace awkward. Uh, yeah, I know this is uncomfortable. I don't always know what to do. Well, welcome to the club. It's okay. <laughs> awkward, that's just normal. I want to take just a few minutes for us to pray. And I want to ask that you would, if the Spirit of God has been speaking to you, that you would confess your own self-reliance and that you would ask him to help you become more reliant on him. Let's take a few minutes and do that. encourage you to not miss out on the freedom that comes in a place of confession and repentance before the Lord. The other place I want us to pray, we did this a couple of weeks ago with Colin. Uh, I want to ask that you don't have to, but I want to encourage you to pray with somebody else, twos, threes. Pray with another. And maybe taking the opportunity to, to pray for one another, a, a dependence upon the Lord. I, I know that's stretching for, for almost everybody. And I just invite you to embrace awkward and invite the Lord. You run out of things to pray for one another. Why don't you pray for the church? Because we want to become more dependent on the Lord ourselves. And so just for a few minutes, I'm going to ask that, that you pray. If you want to just sit quietly to yourself, feel free. But... Encourage us to, to pray out loud. Uh, pick a partner. Again, two, three. Let's pray. A few minutes, and then we'll worship. <laughs> 